it. But my guest tonight is Joanne Hardesty, and she's running for uh, city council and uh, in Salzman's? Yes, position three. Position three. Which currently is held by Dan Salzman. Forever. Uh, only 18 <laughs> years. Only 18 Yes, years. yes. Yeah. So uh, you've been on the show before. I think it's probably with police accountability True. issues, and this will be part of our second segment as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, did you just decide to do this recently? Or I guess I should say what made you decide to do this? Because mm -hmm. you've been in the mix in Portland politics for a long, and, and uh, Oregon politics for a long time. Very true. Um, I was elected to the Oregon House uh, and served there from... Um, let's see, that was from, I got out in 2001, so from 97 to 2001, I served in the Oregon House. Um, but I've been an activist from the day I came to Portland, uh, which was January 1st, 1990. Uh, so I've seen a lot of changes happen here. But the day I decided that something had to change was the day I showed up at City Hall when Charlie uh, uh, Hales was mayor and they were negotiating the Portland Police Association's new contract that he opened and he didn't have to and negotiated behind closed doors. I showed up, Homeland Security, Portland Police, TriMet, Gresham Police were surrounding City Hall, preventing the public from going inside to testify. That was the day I knew that we had the wrong people on the city council. You know, I used to think that maybe we might have uh, somebody, at least from the grassroots, with Amanda Fritz. And the fact that she got on with the voter-owned elections was a good idea. Right, But right. even if she is, she's only one person. And she's the only, the only uh, woman, and there's no people of color. Well, there's actually, Chloe Udaly was elected in the last election. That's right, I she that. beat Steve Novick. That's right. That's uh, right. And I, that was I a phenomenal it. election. Uh, everybody was doom and gloom because of the presidential. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that said something very strong. Uh, Chloe Udaly had a message, uh, and the message was about her experience as a single mom with a disabled child, being, uh, having to find housing over and over and over again because it was getting too expensive for her to live where she was living. Along with a lot of other people. Along with, right, so it really touched people, right? Mm -hmm. And then you had Steve Novick, who was, if you don't like what I'm doing, don't vote for me. So the people did. So they did. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, well, you know, he uh, he was there running against uh, Jeff for the Senate, Merkley. Oh, yes, and, yes, uh, yes. Merkley, you know, I didn't really know what would be the best of the two, but I think I chose the right one. Oh, I love Jeff Merkley, and he is still the same man he was that I met at the World mm -hmm. Affairs Council. Mm -hmm. I was on the board, and he was executive director. Decent man, ha very humble. It hasn't ha changed much, it seems like. He right. hasn't changed at all. You know, people say D.C. changes you. Wow. Uh, Jeff Merkley is still the. Every time I see him, he still gives me a big hug. Mm -hmm. You know, there's MS no... MSNBC didn't change him either. No, no, no. <laughs> so. And, so I love him. But mm -hmm. we're here to talk about my campaign. Sure. <laughs> but we want, it's obvious from what we're talking about that, you know... I've you, been around. You, you've been around. Yes. And, you know, that's, that was the whole idea that right. uh, you're, you're, uh, you've been in the trenches. And uh, I think that uh, Amanda was in the trenches, too. She was a nurse or something. So she, she well, came through that. Are you coming through any particular uh, theme or any particular... Well, I come uh, from the grassroots, right? I have always been an advocate. I've always trained low-income people and people of color to, to use their voice to advocate for their own best interests, right? So I did that at Oregon Action for seven years. As a legislator, I saw my role not as a... Um, I saw my role as a grassroots activist who was there to represent the people who weren't in that building, the people who sent me there. Um, and so when I started thinking about running for the city council, there are two seats up this year. But quite frankly, Dan's been there a long time. And 18 years is too long, uh, in my opinion, to hold a seat um, uh, as an elected official, right? Unless you're doing phenomenal work. I'm not saying he's a bad man, he hasn't done some good things, but, eight, but for 18 years you should be able to point to some significant progress. Um, and we're in a city where uh, the economic outcome for low income people, people of color, uh, immigrants and refugees uh, is dire, right? Uh, we mm -hmm. didn't even declare a housing emergency until white people started being priced out of Northeast Portland. 
right? Mm -hmm. 10,000 black families were displaced uh, from 20 to 2010 and not one peep from our elected officials, right? So we continue to believe that we're somehow this progressive city. Uh, but the reality is that Native Americans are at the bottom of every social economic Everything. determinant yes. of health. African Americans are right on top of them and the Latino community is right on top of them. So we haven't made any progress as people of color since 1847, not significantly. I won't say no progress, but not significant. When you look mm -hmm. at outcomes, in 1847, Oregon passed the first law prohibiting black people from living in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And we weren't even a state yet, we were just a territory, right? Uh, but if you look at outcomes, we have lived that legacy over and over and over again. But yet we tell this narrative of being this very progressive city, uh, that we're really inclusive, we welcome everyone, uh, and that's just simply not true. So the first thing I want to do is talk about access to City Hall. Um, I'm running because I live in East Portland, and until Sam Adams was mayor, uh, we couldn't get anybody on the city council to acknowledge that East Portland was not getting this fair share of resources. I mean, we didn't even get sidewalks until Sam Adams was mayor. We had streets that, when it rained, and you know how often it rains, mm -hmm. uh, kids are walking in these big, huge holes um, uh, to school, right? And when it rains and, the and it's dark, it was very, very dangerous. So we had many deaths in the community before elected officials finally acknowledge we needed our fair share of sidewalks and transportation infrastructure. Do we have our fair share yet? No, we mm -hmm. don't. But we also have no representation on the Portland City Council. Everybody on the Portland City Council, with the exception of you daily, lives in Southwest Portland. So Southwest Portland is well represented. Uh, the rest of us, not so much. And so for me, I want there's no constitutional mandate that city council meetings happen 9.30 on Wednesday morning downtown. So who's that convenient for, right? People who live downtown. People who live downtown, people who are paid to influence city hall. Those are the people that a 9.30 a.m. meeting is convenient for. So why not do a meeting in East Portland once a month? We're moving why, around, right. Why not do yeah. one in North Portland once a month? And why not, why not do one of the meetings downtown in the evening, right? Uh, because that would mean you're serving the people who elected you to mm -hmm. serve them, right? Because elected leaders should go to the people that they represent to find out what they, what they need, right? And how they can help. We have a lot of talent in this city we don't even talk to, right? And so I want to talk to every corner of the city because we've got to solve these problems collectively, mm -hmm. right? We can't sure. pretend that people who are at City Hall are going to fix it all, right? It's going to take the community the business community, the nonprofit community, the grassroots community, all of us. That's what the community means. That's right. So access is number one. Mm -hmm. uh, the second issue is housing and houselessness. I'm appalled that the housing bond that we passed in November will make us build the most expensive affordable housing units on the planet. Uh, we're going to spend somewhere between $235,000 and $255,000 per unit for these affordable housing units but yet we're supposedly in an emergency, right? Had we wrote the proposal so that community development uh, uh, corporations could have built the housing, we could have built three times the housing units. And who are we building for, right? Um, everybody can't live independently. So why aren't we building housings with services attached to the housing? Everybody doesn't need a kitchen or a laundry room, right? Mm -hmm. um, so why aren't we building housing with shared kitchens so that we're creating community, right? So that people are looking out for each other. You know your neighbors. At least you get to know them, right? You, right, you get to know your neighbors, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you find out you don't like them, you don't have to go to that dinner, right? <laughs> you can do it yourself, yeah. right? But, but it's about building community, right? Mm -hmm. and, and being your brother's keeper, because that's who we're supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> so housing is really important. But we need all kind of income housing, right? This plan to move, I don't know who they're planning to move back into inner Northeast, but supposedly uh, the people who have been displaced uh, by public policy, by PDC, um, uh, are supposed to have right of return to inner Northeast Portland. Now I say right to return to what? Right? And from what? Some of them might have lost everything because they had to leave. Right, right. And quite frankly, you can't leave law enforcement out of that equation, right? Because if you target a community for enhanced policing, 
uh, and people get arrested and people go to prison, right? A lot of um, unintended consequences, or maybe they are intended consequences, come out of that, yeah, right? Um, so, so we have to look at how people live. We should be building housing where grandparents are babysitting so that the parents are working, right? And the kids are being paid to teach the grandparents computer skills, right? And how to use the internet and how to use social media. Uh, there are a lot of things we could do if we didn't have the same people sure. in charge of the problem over and over and over again, right? Well, the, that compartmentalization is going on at all levels of society. And it seems to me that that would be one decent step in the right direction. We have to talk to each other, mm -hmm. right? So that we understand, because people who live in a bubble really doesn't understand what happens outside that bubble. And that's how I see City Hall. I mean, they just keep doing the same thing over and over again, expecting we're gonna get different results. And we don't. Um, so uh, that was housing and houselessness. The next one is jobs. The best anti-crime program is a living wage, family wage job. Um, and we do a horrible job of getting people connected to those type of employment opportunities. I've had the privilege over the last couple of years of working with a coalition, including the Native American Youth and Family Center, including APANO, the Asian Pacific Islander Network of Oregon, including um, uh, Verde, which works primarily with a Latino, Latino. population. Uh, of course, the NAACP Portland's at the table, Sierra Club, and 350 PDX. And we've developed a ballot measure initiative uh, called the Portland Just Energy Transition Measure. This measure would, would add a 1% tax to the business tax that uh, retail operations pay uh, to the city of Portland uh, for retail operations with $1 billion national sales, $1 billion with a B, and half a million dollars in sales in the city of Portland. This pool of money would then be used to address climate change, to help with infrastructure improvement, to train the workforce from people who've been left out of the economic engine. And so we're talking about the opportunity to make huge investments in low-income people, people of color, ex-felons, people who live in our community who need to create uh, uh, living wage opportunities, right? People who want to hand up. That, that, that want to yeah. work for what they mm -hmm. get, right? Sure. And the wonderful thing about this is we say that we're moving towards 100% renewables, right? 2030 electricity, 2050 everything, right? So why are we expanding freeways? Why aren't we training people mm -hmm. in the new economy, right? That incl and includes new clean energy, right? Uh, people of color are not benefiting from climate, uh, from we're, we're being devastated by climate change and we're not being beneficiaries of any kind of energy improvement programs, right? If you live in a low-income apartment complex, um, your landlord doesn't see the benefit of retrofitting that apartment complex. This measure, if we wanted to in the first two years, we could retrofit every low-income multifamily housing unit in the city of Portland. If we wanted to in four years, we could do that for every low-income homeowner, right? We're talking about real investments and then the training program that moves people from apprenticeships to journeymen and stays with them to remove the barriers so that they get mm -hmm. full employment, right? Nobody wants a handout who can, is able to work, right? And people want dignity in their day. So providing a living wage job in this new emerging um, energy economy, which is quite, quite frankly, uh, mostly white, mostly male, right? Mm -hmm. And doesn't even recruit in communities of color. In so, this country, it's that way. In this right? country, yeah. right. In this country, it's that way, right? And certainly true in Oregon. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that's jobs. And last but not least, of course, police, right? I'm very excited uh, that uh, chief, um, I just love having a, a police chief named Outlaw. <laughs> <laughs> that does it for me, too. <laughs> Danielle Outlaw uh, mm -hmm. will be joining uh, Portland Police Bureau as the police chief in October. In October, yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to go to Oakland because I want to visit her and her turf. Uh, but I also want to give her a community perspective of what she's walking into. Because I can't imagine she's walking into a welcoming environment. Uh, uh -huh. Because the police operation is a very military type operation. Mm -hmm. um, and it is very cliquish. 
And so an outsider is going to have to prove themselves right away. Number one. Just being a woman, she's an outsider. And I was, well, I was headed to the woman. Oh, right. And then add the icing, right. she's a black woman, right? right? right. Uh, and she's from Oakland, California, right? And so um, her style is going to be really um, off-putting for people in Portland because, right, we have, we die from uh, over politeness, right? Uh, we have Portland polite, so we don't want people uncomfortable, right? Uh, so when you speak directly, people will get nervous, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so... I just want to talk to her um, as a black woman who's lived in Portland for 28 years. I think I have some um, observations that would be helpful for her mm -hmm. when she comes. Well, she needs another perspective other than the one she's probably been getting through the media and through through uh, whatever uh, interviews or whatever she's been getting. Right. That's right. gonna go. Uh, it's gonna be a completely different road she's gonna be hearing about. It you. is. Um, and I also have reached out to. Uh, law enforcement personnel around the state um, who I believe are really committed to transforming policing as we know it. Um, and so I've created this network so that if she needs law enforcement advice, she needs policing advice, uh, there's a short list of law enforcement officers that I trust that, that she could tap into. Uh, so I want to do that. I also want to make sure that she's got community support because I know the police bureau will push back. I know that the, uh, I can't remember how many years ago, but we did have one a female uh, police chief, and it didn't end well. I don't remember what all oh, happened. Oh, Rosie Sizer. Yeah, something Rosie like Sizer was appointed by Tom Potter. Was an appointment. Yeah. See how long I've been around? <laughs> yeah, I remember something <laughs> happening, but I don't remember what it was. Well, you might remember Derek Foxworth um, had a scandal, mm -hmm. and he was placed on administrative leave. And when the investigation was over, uh, uh, mayor at that time, Tom Potter, decided to replace the police chief and appointed Rosie Sizer. So that's how she became police mm. chief. Um, and uh, she left right after her and Dan Salzman held a press conference to say she wasn't getting enough money in the proposed budget. Uh, I don't think mayors like it when um, the police chief holds a press conference to say they, they want more money. They want more money. And the mayor didn't put it in the budget. So. Mm. And so she put in retirement papers shortly thereafter. Thereafter, so <laughs> yeah. I, I, I noted it was kind of abrupt. Yeah, I yeah, do yeah. Remember that part? It was pretty quick. But it, you know, getting back to outlaw. <laughs> yeah, right. I, and I so, think that uh, I think that's a. Uh, I think that might have been a good choice. I think it was an excellent choice, and everyone I know who participated in the interviews said she came in at either one or two. So everybody was very impressed with her. Mm -hmm. um, but it took courage for Mayor Wheeler. I beat up on Mayor Wheeler a lot, but it really took courage for him to appoint her mm -hmm. because it would have been a lot easier to keep Marshman because the union was putting all kind of pressure to keep Marshman. Uh, and quite frankly, because Marshman wasn't going to make him do anything different. That's exactly what uh, we need to get away from. Exactly right. Yes, so. yes. And that's one of the reasons why... I just felt now's the time. Now's the time for me to go from grassroots activist. You know, I've gone from legislator to back to grassroots activist. Now I'm going to go to the city council, but I'll never lose my desire to connect with the people, find out what they need and how to get uh, their needs met in a way that mm -hmm. actually makes sense and is transparent, right? Um, and addresses some of the core issues in our community. Uh, when people say we live in a progressive city, uh, yet the city of Portland has never figured out how to contract with people of color. Last year, there was 100,000 electrician hours contracted with city dollars, taxpayer dollars. African Americans got 10.3 hours out of that 100,000 hours. And so when I go to city council and they talk about minority women and emerging small businesses, I say, I don't want to hear about minority emerging and minority small businesses. I want to know how many black people got contracts. I want to know how many Latinos got contracts, how many Asian Pacific Islanders, how many white, um, how many were subcontractors, and mm -hmm. what jobs are they working on, right? Because when they clump it all together, uh, it's very easy to hide the fact uh, that we get no contracts from, the, from our tax dollars. They go primarily to white-owned uh, or female. Uh, the biggest pri uh, primary beneficiary are white females uh, to contracting with the city of Portland. 
Does the, they, did the city of Portland open it up and, and make it obvious to the to people of color that, that these electrician jobs are there? Did they just not make it available? <clears throat> they have a lot of um, uh, uh, things that they do that they say they call outreach uh, to, right, yeah. uh, you know, small business owners. I mean, the city loves to have meetings, right? And if you are a one-person shop or a two-person shop, you can't go to every city meeting because you never know which one will actually be meaningful or which one will waste your time, right? Um, and the city loves to have meetings. They, they just think that volunteers have all the time in the world, right? Mm -hmm. They're getting paid and we're all sitting there. Sure. And they're just like, talk, 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 That's talk, talk. That's the bureaucracy. Talk. That's the bureaucracy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's the disrespect for the people who are volunteering their time, who have taken off work, take, uh, taken out of school, got out of school early, uh, got childcare, right? To come and have their two to three minutes uh, at city council chamber. So we have to change that because that's not mm -hmm. what's intended when you say governance. That's not governance, right? That's uh, closed doors, backroom deals that we find out about after the fact. That's just us. <laughs> just us, right? Just us who have it, continue mm -hmm. to keep it. And those who don't, we just keep coming up with new words. Sure. Well, it certainly sounds to me like uh, listening to what you're talking about there, you have a really important platform and it goes to the heart of the issues here. And uh, you're not really uh, entering into this against Salzman. No, it's no. It's just that he's been treading water or whatever and, well, you, and you've got some better ideas. Well, and in fact, I went to him. I, you know, I thought that that was the polite thing to do. I've known Salzman since mm -hmm. I worked for Bev Stein at Multnomah County. I thought it was the polite thing to do, make an appointment, come in, look him in his eye and say, I'm running for a Portland City Council position three. And I just thought I should tell you face to face. And by the way, you should retire and endorse me. Mm -hmm. That was the conversation I had with him. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently that is not normal. People don't normally do that. Well, you know, the people are usually in, in, in uh, campaigns are adversarial. And uh, it doesn't have to be that way. No. You bring up a good point. No, it, uh, well, and yeah, this is not an anti Salsman campaign. This is a campaign to make sure that we become one Portland, right? Because we're headed down a path now where we're on the path to have two separate Portlands. The filthy witch who come here and see this as a playground and they're riding around in their Ubers and, they're, uh, and they bought their 2.5 cars and their bicycles, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they have a totally different experience in Portland living in these very expensive high-rise apartments, right? That are going that, up all over the that place. That are going up yeah. everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, in fact, 75% of the housing units going up are luxury units. And in a housing emergency, who's that for? Certainly not for you and I. It certainly isn't for the people that are in the emergency situation. Right, right, right. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, so it's appalling to live in a city where we say one thing, but what we do is totally different. Uh, another example, we say we're a sanctuary city. Based on what? We still have families being torn apart, right? We still have uh, ICE agents going into Multnomah County Courthouse and dragging people out after they testify. Mm -hmm. So and Sending them up to Tacoma. Sending them up to Tacoma, mm -hmm. yeah. to detention centers, and mm -hmm. then not uh, notifying their families, right? Um, there's nothing sanctuary about the city of Portland. In fact, I feel less safe living in Portland today than I did when I moved here January 1st, 1990. Is that because of the Trump situation? Or it is, is, it is just uh, icing on the cake, I guess. That is the icing on the cake, right? Because uh, the black community has basically been rendered invisible. There are a couple of people who might make some money. Uh, uh, Carlos Construction signs are all up and down Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard but I have not seen one black person on a site there, mm -hmm. right? But I bet the city of Portland will call that a minority uh, uh, win, right? It, it's not, it's not. And so we fail over and over and over again. And so I'm looking forward to the opportunity of, of making a lot of people uncomfortable mm -hmm. as we get to a new paradigm where we really are working on the issues that impact the most vulnerable people in our community. Because if we take care of them, uh, the other people will be okay. Well, I think it was Jim Hightower, it might not have been, but he, he said the first thing you gotta do is agitate. 
oh. whether it's in the streets yes. or it's in the suites or you know, <laughs> however however you want to put it. And uh, you know, yes. uh, it sounds to me like a little agitation has been way past needed. Yes. Uh, whether it was uh, I forget what they did uh, with the. Uh, PJDTF when they oh, yes. were going to pass that the day before Thanksgiving and the only reason anybody heard about it was Dan Handelman that's happened right. to be there that's right. and the whole thing about fluoride yes. where they were doing that with the fluoride people that's for right. months in advance behind closed doors uh, it's right. way past time for agitation yes yes well in fact um, the good news is I have a good relationship with Ted Wheeler um, and by his invitation I meet with him with another small group of black people. Um, every couple of weeks, right? So we've been meeting regularly because his staff, I think, found me um, difficult uh, because I'm straight. I'm a straight shooter. I don't know how to beat around the bush. If I have something to say, I'm just going to say it. Um, and I think they saw me as not someone who was an ally of Ted Wheeler. I am. I, I want him to be successful. I want him to be a good mayor. Uh, but I think his staff uh, I noticed that they weren't returning my phone calls or my emails, <laughs> yeah. and then I tested it, and I sent the <laughs> one-sentence email, and for a month I heard nothing, right? And so I responded back and then copied the chief of staff, Maurice Henderson, and said, okay, fine, so apparently you've decided that the police search is an inside city hall deal. Good luck with that. When it blows up in your face, don't call me, because uh, you're going to create a mess, uh, and it'll be your job to get out of it. Like, mm -hmm. I was through with them. I like I had washed my hands. Like, okay, uh, I am not your problem. If if I'm your biggest problem, you don't have any problems, right? You, you don't have any idea what your problem is. Right, are. right. You have no clue if you think I'm your problem, yeah. right? Um, mm -hmm. And so Ted, to his credit, uh, said uh, started setting up these every two week meetings. Um, and quite frankly, I'm not easy on him. Uh, it's behind closed doors, and I asked him really hard questions. For example, I'm still waiting to see why the police didn't arrest Jeremy Christensen um, the night before he murdered two people and injured another. Because he was hassling some woman. I a 42-year-old African-American woman. He was doing the same racial epithet, screaming at the top of his voice, mm -hmm. uh, and threw a Gatorade bottle at her. Fortunately, she had some self-defense techniques. She had mace. She maced him, and she kneed him. Um, and when she and she tried to get the max driver to call the police and he wouldn't and he wouldn't come out of the little booth um, and when she got off the train at the exact same max station in hollywood she walked up to two police officers she saw reported what happened one of them went to talk to him they talked to him for a couple of minutes let him go and then came back and started questioning her as if she was uh uh, the violator, right? The victim, what what yeah. are you doing on this train so late, right? Where are you going? Uh, can we see your ID? She's like, I'm assaulted, and you're asking mm -hmm. me all these questions? Why'd you let him go, right? I asked the mayor. So um, I want to know, I want to see the written report that came in uh, that that police officer wrote that night uh, to see what he wrote, right? Mm -hmm. Because clearly, had he arrested Jeremy Christensen on Thursday, Friday would not have happened. Right. He would have been on a mental health hole or he would have been in jail, mm -hmm. but he would have not been on the street and those murders would not have taken place. Are those reports that they write up, are they public domain? Well, uh, if you ask the mayor, the mayor can get anything. Right. True. They work for him. So but it is a mandate that you can get it. It's, well, I could do a public records request and, do, and ask for it. Mm -hmm. Right. And they could delay, delay, delay. Sure. But since I talk to the mayor every two weeks. <laughs> I figure he's the one I should ask. Mm -hmm. So the first time I asked him, he went to his assistant. Are, are you about ready to take a break? Or do you want me to finish this one? Finish. finish. Okay. Uh, so I, his assistant. I'm just trying to keep track of time. Okay, here. no worries. All right. I, I was just checking because, you know, I, I can talk. Well, that's what um, we're here to do. <laughs> right, 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 right. It is a talk show, yes. Uh, so anyway, I, uh, his assistant, uh, the mayor told his assistant, uh, please uh, check on that, right? Two weeks later, I come back and I say, so what you find? The assistant says, well, I talked to the officer. The officer said he couldn't find him. I said, I didn't ask you to talk to the officer. I asked you for the written report so that mm -hmm. we could see what he wrote down that night at the end of his shift, right? Because that's what I'm interested in. I'm not interested in what he says today. And so the mayor says again, okay, we'll, we'll get you that. And so a couple of weeks go by and other stuff's happening at the city council, so I can't check on it. Two weeks go by, another two weeks go by, 
And I asked, okay, so where are we? Now the mayor's uh, playing kind of uh, uh, non-committal, right? He says, well, I think that's under investigation by IPR. I said, I don't care. I don't care what IPR is doing. I had one simple request, which is I want to see what was written on that report the night, that Thursday night at that, after that incident, right? Um, so again, I made it clear that that's all I want to see. I want to see what's in writing. Did he write a report, right? Did he report it at all? He might not Is it have. written down? Yeah. <laughs> Why is it so difficult to get a copy of a written report, right? When every police encounter is supposed to be written down, mm -hmm. right? So I'm it's, just- It's for them as well as for the citizens. Too. Exactly, right? Because, right, it's a check and balance, right? right? Uh, between what you tell people and what's actually written in the report, right? So, so I'll let you know how that works out. Looking forward to hearing that. <laughs> I'm looking forward to hearing that. But you again, know, I mean, but so policing operates differently depending upon who the crime victim is um, and who the perceived uh, um, uh, criminal is, mm -hmm. right? And so we paint a picture of criminality that didn't fit with those police officers when they showed up and she said, I've been a victim. Mm -hmm. And by the way, she did a press conference this morning. I was I just going to mention, I thought yes. I heard that. So mm -hmm. that was, I'm glad that uh, I haven't seen the coverage of it. But yes. Hopefully I'll catch some later tonight. Right. Well, we've gone into the second half hour already. We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of your candidacy. Uh, uh, I know <laughs> that uh, you've made some really good points, and I want right. to make one point. That right. I'm glad you mentioned Native Americans twice. Yes. Because they're in talk about invisible they're the ones that are invisible That's if right. you want to compare them to the afro-american community right. african-american community are not invisible because the, the the native americans they don't even come up on the discussion of of, dis of uh, discrimination usually Be well, mainly a lot of it's because they're such a small group but that alone is because Right, of right. Been that's right, them. right, right, right. There's a reason why they're yeah, a small right. group. Yes, that's right. And the same with the african-american look at the jails There's mm -hmm. a reason why we're a small group, right? Um, it was not by accident. And so I think we really do have to acknowledge that our systems are broken. And I mean, so just like earlier this year, Portland Tribune did this whole article on the high cost of being black in Multnomah County. And it said every step of the criminal justice system, if you're black, the uh, charge, uh, the sentence, the fine are all much more severe mm -hmm. across the board, right? Uh, if you're black, you're 54 times more likely to be charged and convicted of spitting on a sidewalk in Portland. Mm -hmm. Right? It's like, how does that happen? It doesn't happen by accident. So then you have to look at the gang outreach numbers and see that 44% of the gang stops are black in a city with a 6% black population. So do the math, mm -hmm. right? How many times do you have to stop a 12 to 24 year old to get to 44% of your total stops for the year of a population that's only 6%? And that's in a city that the federal Department of Justice come up with some guidelines for Portland police to stop profiling. Yes, yes, exactly. On right. top of all that. So, uh, so we have a lot of work to do. And unfortunately, I think that we, the public, haven't done a good job of holding our elected leaders accountable, and our elected leaders haven't done a good job of actually solving these systemic problems. Mm -hmm. They've just been passing it down the road. Passing it down the road and spinning it, right? Because now everybody talks equity, but nobody has a clue what equity looks like. Uh, mm -hmm. And in fact, I told the mayor, if you have one more uh, resolution with equity in the title, I'm gonna scream, <laughs> right? Because basically at the city of Portland, it means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. It's a way to say, oh, yeah, yeah, we know there are people of color out there, so we'll just use this word as a placeholder, right? Mm -hmm. um, I heard that the, uh, the Bureau of Environmental Service, uh, uh, their definition of equity is if there's 12% people of color, 12% of their projects should be uh, in people of color communities. That is the stupidest definition of equity I've ever heard, right? Equity is about um, ensuring that you are writing the inequitable outcomes that people get, which means that if you've got inequitable outcomes in one area, you put more resources there to address those inequitable outcomes. Measure 97 is a great example of that. Remember when I was on the ballot and we were, uh, we were being asked to pass a ballot measure to give three billion new dollars to the legislature because they needed more money, right? Mm -hmm. um, when they came to the NAACP, I said, uh, 
So does this mean that in education and healthcare and senior services, you're going to reduce the inequitable outcomes, right? You're going to invest that money to make sure that everybody across the board gets equitable services in those areas. You know, they told me, we'll, we'll, we'll lobby for that after we pass it, after we pass right? It. I said, mm -hmm. oh, so I'm supposed to trust the same legislative body that had a special session to give Nike a 30-year uh, tax break? And then the first order of business at the regular session gave Intel a 30-year tax break. I'm supposed to trust them? Mm -hmm. Like, based on what, right? It's if they need the money. Well, quite frankly, they didn't make the case for them needing the money. What they, what they did was um, just try to sell us something out of fear. And I think that's why the housing bond passed. Because people are, see, you can see people sleeping on the sidewalk. And mm -hmm. my neighborhood... People are 50 and older on freeway overpass begging for money. Veterans, a lot of them. Veterans, a lot they of them. claim to be, and I'm sure a lot of them are. I'm sure a lot of them are. Right? But women, we have 50-year-old women on freeway overpass in my neighborhood. We don't have hipsters begging for money so they can buy beer. Right? Or travelers like on Hawthorne. Right, or travelers mm, yeah. who are just passing through. We've got elders in our community. Something's wrong with a society that allows that to happen. Mm hmm. Yeah, we've I've had homeless uh, advocates on many mm -hmm. houseless, if you want right, to say right. that, too. And uh, it, it's pretty well established among a lot of the folks that I talk to that it's it's a social societal issue. It's not an individual. issue. It, it is. isn't these. You know, I mean, you can say it's this person's fault for this right. and that person's fault for right. that. But the general thing is it's society is functioning the way it is because it needs people to be down and out. Well, when housing costs goes up 160 percent in uh, three years, um, and your salary doesn't go up 160%, right away, mm -hmm. uh, you got a problem. And your rent's bumped 300 bucks. Right, and, right. Yeah. Uh, and every, right, every six months, your landlord is raising it, not, not changing anything, mm -hmm. just raising it because they don't want to be left out of making all this money, right? Um, and, if you, and you're fearful of complaining because if you complain, guess what? All of a sudden, you're evicted. Yep. In 30 days, I guess 60 now, but at one time it was 30 days yeah. notice, and that's not enough. It's actually longer now, and then we also have a, um, um, uh, well, for no-cause eviction, you get assistance and right. moving, right? And that did go through, right? Yes, that did pass, so. and, and Chloe uh, was champion of that. So our newest commissioner came in talking about housing and went to work right away on housing so well housing is an important thing and I'm, it, it was what your second point right and uh you, and you, then jobs right and then place uh so if folks want to get more uh, information about these bullet points right. your website yes it is joanne for portland the word for for, uh, for portland.com all right well I'd, you've uh, brought a lot of good information and you know i mean the bullet points important but it's also what i i see even more so than the things that you want to do is the uh, the knowledge you have and the dynamics of what's going on in the city right and you know, that and which has led you to develop the, with your course of action obviously that's but right still having all those connections and knowing what's going on right. and uh, and all the players involved right. i think is is probably the biggest part of why you would be a uh, uh, something that was really good for the city council. Well, here's the funny thing. I tell people only half jokingly, if I worked this hard for you for free, can you imagine what I'd do if you paid me, mm -hmm. right? Because uh, it makes me crazy. It costs me money to advocate, right? And, sure. But I do it because I have to. Um, and that's how I feel about this seat. It's not... I've never wanted to be on the city council, right? I've always thought that was a boring job. It doesn't look like a lot of fun. It doesn't look like Probably fun. It pays well, right? according to it. It pays well, right? But it's, it, it's a boring job. But it has so much responsibility for the health of our community, right? And, again, some people are benefiting and some aren't. Mm -hmm. Well, here we are with 18 minutes and 45 seconds left, and we, we could go on with this. And the whole program, oh, my goodness. Yeah, 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 well, you know, you <laughs> Told said, you. <laughs> you said half an hour. I said, ah, we could do that standing on our heads. But there's a lot, you know, and then we can move into the, uh, into the uh, what I called uh, uh, global. And it is global because this, this march towards right-wing politics yes. and uh, the alt-right, the alt which is not really what it is. It, it's definitely... I uh, don't know why we don't just call it the KKK it's basically, revisit it. Basically it's what exactly it is. what it is, right? Well, those torches kind of showed that. Yes, it did. You know, I, and, and so that, that's what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. 
for the remainder of the show, even right. though it, it's, it's going on in England, it's been going on in Germany. They know how yes. to put a stop to it. Yes. In fact, I saw one thing on Facebook that uh, these folks were coming into cities and they were really uh, uh, intimidating people and doing these marches. And right. so people just started saying, well, they're putting up signs saying that uh, uh, this march is going to make so much donations towards anti-right groups uh -huh. um, and they, the city they left had they had to leave the city because they were just every time they'd march they bring out money against them right right. so there, there are creative ways to do it yes i'm, I'm not saying anything against uh, antifa right but but there are different ways of going about doing it absolutely well you know um i i have to say for me um i'm always about nonviolent direct action um, and any march I put together, any march I participate in, that has to be the core principle, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's ludicrous to get into street fights with, uh, uh, with KKK members, right? I don't think that's my job. But here's what I'm fearful of. Uh, there's this trend in policing under Jeff Sessions, exactly. um, yeah. Attorney General's um, command, where the police see their role as protecting the KKK and the white supremacists against um, the, uh, the other side, right? Against mm -hmm. the um, anti-hate groups. Uh, and I find that appalling. And I find that very frightening. Um, it is, I, w I said a little earlier, I am more afraid today to live in Portland than I have ever been in my whole 28 years living here. I don't know when a car slows down whether somebody's about to yell a racial epithet at me. I don't know if they are going to throw something at me. I don't know if they're going to try to run me over with their car, right? I am very mindful and aware of my black skin in Portland. And what's going on around you. And what's going on <laughs> yeah. around me. Um, every day on Facebook, there are attacks against black people and brown people in the city of Portland. I, I find it troubling that we can get thousands of people to come out in March when a white woman in Charleston is killed, but a black man shot in the back by a Portland police officer running away mm -hmm. doesn't get that same kind of outrage, right? I, I have noticed that even after the Max killings, we can mobilize significant numbers of white people when someone dies. Why can't we mobilize a significant number to stand up against the KKK, against white supremacy, without people having to die? And quite frankly, white people having to die because they don't get that worked up when they're black or brown. No, not. in fact, it was not too long ago, there was a, a Native American woman, a friend of uh, the folks, the fellow that does the Native Nations, the host. Yes. A friend of his was killed, I think it was in Reno, in a car. <sighs> Ran into a bunch of people and killed. You hardly even heard about that. No, no. I mean, and, but that's happening all over. And I think that we have this false sense that, oh, but that was Charleston, right? That, that doesn't happen here. It is happening in Portland every single day, mm -hmm. and it's happening under the radar, right? And it's because people are emboldened. We have number 45 who preaches hate everywhere he goes um, and has, has awakened uh, what was considered um, ill-polite um, when Obama was in office. I absolutely believe that this resurgence of white supremacy is a blowback from Obama being elected. I was thinking that today myself. Absolutely, right? It wasn't, it wasn't uh, <clears throat> Trump, it was Obama. It hadn't gone away, but it, was, it wasn't polite to tell people about your hateful, racist, homophobic, xenophobic mm -hmm. uh, attitude, right? Uh, but under Trump, it has been given permission to be sure.